Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. My guests on today's episode, Sandra Garrett Thompson and Nicole Caceres, have been involved with what may be the first independent publicly funded crime lab in the country, indeed in the world, the Houston Forensic Science Center in Houston, Texas, created about six years ago after scandal rocked the Houston Police Department and led to all kinds of problems with the quality of the science and contributed to a public perception that there's a lack of transparency, there is a lack of quality, and there is a propensity to wrongful convictions. Does this at all sound familiar in the context of the growing debate over public uh, attention on police reform and the need for police reform. Well, it's central to the issue of police accountability. Most people probably don't even think about the fact that crime labs, those scientists responsible for producing the evidence, whether fingerprint evidence, blood spatter evidence, a whole range of evidence that is essential in criminal cases that lead to prosecutions and in some cases, in some very tragic cases, to wrongful convictions, that these crime labs must have greater transparency, must have science done in the name of science and not merely to aid in accomplishing convictions. Sandra and Nicole have written about this, teach about this at their respective law schools, and served as the chair and vice chair of the board of directors of the Houston Forensic Science Center. And they join me to explain why blindness, blind scientific testing is essential to achieving true independent and blind justice and avoiding the pitfalls that face so many police departments around the country. Most uh, importantly, the violence uh, and discriminant uh, attention given to uh, Black Americans and other racial minorities in this country. They have found through their experience, not only that wrongful convictions can be avoided, but that the quality of science can be improved and overall confidence in the way police departments operate today in cities around the country can be vastly improved if the model set in Houston would be understood better and would be followed by others. So stay tuned for a really fascinating conversation in an era where it seems like science is being ignored more and more to our peril as a society. In Houston, they are experimenting with putting the emphasis on science in ways that I think could have a very profound impact as it has already done so there. Stay tuned for this important episode. Please stay safe, everybody. Continue to wear your masks when you can't socially distance. Uh, do everything you can to take care of each other and enjoy this episode of Good Law, Bad Law. Well, they say that uh, justice should be blind, and actually that's a very good thing, uh, contrary to what you might think about uh, that idea. And my guests today have, have devoted a lot of work uh, in their research, in their teaching, in their writing, including a new article they have co-authored on the issue of crime labs and how that uh, needs to be uh, independent and blind in the testing, has to be separated from police departments, uh, which is not the way it's, uh, such things are handled in most communities. But it is how things have been handled in Houston, where both of them uh, teach and work. And uh, really welcome both of you today to, to join us on the podcast and explain how this important issue relates not only to crime lab testing, but to the whole issue of criminal justice more broadly and uh, how it can help avoid wrongful convictions in the first place. So my guest, Sandra Guerra Thompson from the University of Houston, uh, law School and Nicole uh, Casares uh, from the University of St. Thomas in Houston. Both of you, thank you so much for being on Good Law, Bad Law today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, so we, we, we communicated a bit about this uh, before today, and, and I thought uh, this is an aspect of uh, the broader issue of criminal justice reform and the problem of wrongful convictions in this country that most people don't really think about, but 
if you've watched any crime drama on television, and I know so many people do, or followed a podcast on you know some true crime topic, or as I did, watched with great attention uh, the Netflix series Making of a Murder, you know how important to a successful prosecution and how crucial in many instances to overturning a wrongful conviction uh, what goes on inside a crime lab can be. Um, and uh, so I, I know, Sandy, this is something you have uh, worked on for a great deal of uh, the work that you're doing and you're teaching. Uh, you recently wrote a book a couple of years ago called Cops in Lab Coats, Curbing Wrongful Convictions with Independent Forensic Laboratories. And both of you were involved early on in the founding of what has become a breakthrough and, and uh, model independent lab, completely independent of, of uh, in this case, the Houston Police Department, the Houston Forensic Science Center in Houston. So I want to get, first of all, I think the background on that and then into some of the details of how it works and why this ought to be a model for other communities around, around the country. Um, you know, I don't know which of you is the best one to give us perhaps just a thumbnail introduction to to the uh, Houston Forensic Science Center, how it was created and, and how that fits into what we're talking about today. Well, I'll start by just by saying that um, Nicole and I have both been involved with the Houston Forensic Science Center from the beginning. So, you know, we both have uh, the same amount of time involved. Um, and I did write a book with an excellent introduction by Nicole Caceres, <laughs> uh, my dear friend and colleague. Um, but I'm going to defer to her because she actually became the chair of the board of directors. Um, and uh, so I, I'm going to let her take this one. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think the first thing to know, uh, if you aren't familiar with it is that back in the early 2000s, um, the Houston Police Department Crime Lab um, was notorious um, for scandal. Uh, just sort of one after another, um, it was uncovered that the Police Department Crime Lab had uh, engaged DNA technicians who were dry labbing cases. And as the community learned of these various scandals and um, Michael Bromwich conducted a famous investigation of the lab, more and more and more came out. And even though then the police department improved the police crime lab, it just didn't seem to be able to get a handle on it. So if they improved the DNA section, then the next headlines were about the fingerprint section and there were more scandals. And um, I think in large part, this was because when a crime lab is situated in a police department, um, it is not a priority for the police chief who sets the budget. And so the crime lab, so if you're a police chief and you have a choice between spending your budget on mm -hmm. uh, new equipment for the cops or more boots on the ground or buying a piece of equipment or hiring qualified scientists for your lab, it seemed as though the lab was always getting, you know, the dregs, the, the last little bit of money. And so the problems just intensified. Anyway, after probably 10 years of scandal, the and, and to, to its credit, the police department was, had, had had enough. And so um, in Sandy's book, she writes about the case involving George Rodriguez, who had been wrongfully convicted in Houston of a rape that he didn't commit because of the, the ineptitude of the HPD crime lab. And the mayor, then he brought a, brought a civil rights lawsuit against the city mm -hmm. and, and won. Uh, the city has now a big payout to Mr. Rodriguez, and part of, as part of that, the mayor of Houston, who at the time was Anise Parker, had you know gave an apology to him. Um, and going through that experience, she said, "I don't ever want this to happen again." 
Now, right around that time, um, the National Academies of Science came out with its report in 2009 uh, about the state of forensic science. And one of its recommendations was that crime labs need to be removed from the oversight of police departments or prosecutors' offices. And again, to HPD's credit um, and the mayor's credit, um, they saw that recommendation and said, let's do it. Let's take the crime lab away from the police department and create an independent lab. So I think it was in 2012, um, the mayor's office contacted me, it, mayor's office contacted uh, Professor Thompson and asked us to serve on a board of directors um, of citizens. So there are, uh, it's a board of directors composed of diverse citizens, nine member board um, that basically would oversee the crime lab and the assets of the crime lab were put into a local government corporation, which is something we have in Texas, um, a, a really a corporate structure for something that fulfills a public function. And um, then we were in charge basically of hiring an executive director, a scientist to run the lab and then organize it and set it up uh, in this new independent form format um, where the board oversee. So the so board members uh, are uh, nominated by the mayor and approved by city council. They can't be removed except for malfeasance, although the term, they, they are term, there are terms and so they don't stay forever, but um, in order to try to insulate those directors from political pressures. So, um, well, in, let me just understand so far. Yeah. So when you say a corporate structure, almost like uh, any corporation or even a nonprofit that has a, has a board of directors that, that set policy, that right. uh, administer, that manage the organization are subject to rules and policies and, and protocols and all, but it's publicly funded and, and Exactly right. That's exactly and it's right. Independent, not only from the political uh, offices of the of the local government, but is independent from the police department leadership absolutely. as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And okay. so, even though the lab then still gets its budget from the city because of this independent structure, it's not uh, it's not underneath. The police. I mean, it's a it's an equal player. It's an equal participant. It has right. as much stroke as the DA's office or the police department. And of course, the directors um, aren't necessarily scientists. Mm -hmm. um, so there's also a technical advisory group of scientists who donate their time to provide scientific advice that's independent from the scientists that are hired in the event the board needs it. Okay. Right. And so, so, so like the, yeah. so if I could just, so like the president and CEO of the lab, right, is hired by the board of directors, but you know, we were on the board of directors and we're not scientists. Right, right. So um, you, have, you have to have scientists to so we, advise. We had it. scientists to advise us to help us better supervise the lab, right? So, cause we can't, you know, I can't just trust that the president of the lab is telling me the right thing because how can I judge that? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we had an outside group to advise us as well. Well, in um, these times, these political times we're living in now, of course, in these pandemic times, it's impressive in itself that you were relying on science and scientists to guide policy and practice here. That was the whole, I mean, that was the whole thing. I mean, the right. whole mantra was let the science speak for itself. The lab is not. Uh, you know, is not meant to help police or prosecutors create cases. I mean, the lab is meant to provide a scientific answer that stands for itself. Whether it helps the police or prosecutor, great. Mm -hmm. If it helps the defense, great. But the science is the science, and that was always the mantra um, at the lab. Now, you mentioned problems with ineptitude, What, however that was However, that problem was created, whether it was from budget 
cuts or budget different budget priorities or just inattention to hiring quality people. But it, it does also seem like part of the problem inherent to the crime lab, and again, the importance of the work done in a crime lab to the work of the police and the prosecution in, in criminal cases. Um, part, part of the problem inherent is, it seems to me, is, is a conflict of interest or a bias that's built in, an anti-science bias that's built in when it is affiliated directly and controlled and managed by a police department. How, how significant do you think that was to creating some of the scandals that, that were coming out of the Houston uh, crime lab? Well, you know, I suspect that it was, it was uh, at work there, right? There was <laughs> some bias because crime lab uh, employees feel as though they're on the police's team when they work hand in glove or when they are officers, right? When they are actually classified officers, yeah, yeah. which now the lab has been civilianized. And so there are no classified officers at the lab at all, none, none whatsoever. So uh, those officers, you know, either transitioned out or they retired and were replaced by civilians. But um, I think, you know, that certainly was um, part of the problem. I don't know that we can quantify how much it was, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but getting, having that independent structure and having a civilianized lab certainly helps to eliminate the, you know, I'm on the prosecution's team or I'm on the police's team mindset. Mm -hmm. And how and I think we have to, yeah. I think Go we ahead. have to be clear about something too, because, you know, we certainly don't mean to, you know, impugn the integrity of right. a lot of forensic scientists because there are a lot of really terrific forensic scientists around the country who strive every day to do good science yeah but one of the things that we became aware of right is that it really matters how you set up a lab and what kind of information analysts are getting about the the test that they're doing um, and so you know if if you're brought a case by an uh, investigating officer as an analyst, and you're told, look, you know, this was a terrorist uh, case, right? And, and many people were killed. And we think this is the fingerprint of the person who, you know, so find a match for us or whatever. Mm -hmm. We think this is a match. What do you think? That kind of information sure. that, that would be uh, ir technically irrelevant to the forensic test, right, has, um, has the potential and will, in most cases, unconsciously affect how the analyst sees the evidence. And so they can be doing their level best to, to uh, analyze the case in an impartial way. But as human beings, right, this is what scientists have shown, as human beings, we are not capable of eliminating those yeah. unconscious biases. Right. And so one of the things that this lab has done is to create a um, an entry point for forensic evidence where case managers receive that information and, you know, sort of package it for testing and make determinations about how it will be tested and then remove to the extent possible that kind of case irrelevant or, or you know, context irrelevant information so that the analysts will get the minimal um, amount of information yeah. that they need, right? And uh, again, that, that has nothing to do with ethics or, uh, you know, like I really want this team to win, kind of that kind of motivational bias, it's unconscious bias. Absolutely. Well, and I think, again, I think that ties into uh, the great giant conversation we're having as a country right now about racism, everybody could, more, you could say, well, we don't have the overt racism that we had in the days when, when John Lewis was trying to cross, you know, the bridge in Selma. But we have, we have to awaken and be much more conscious of all the ways in which there is implicit bias, unconscious bias. And so when, when people hear about bias in a scientific context, they might, again, think, oh, well, these are, these are good quality scientists and they're not prejudiced in any overt way. 
but but the ways in which in a scientific study in a scientific experiment or in a scientific uh, analysis in a crime lab there are all there are these ways in which you could have implicit bias injected and that doesn't that go to to the part in a way of or, or perhaps to the other side of the coin on why wrongful convictions are so damaging because of course any individual who's wrongfully convicted that is a great harm done to that person and their families but it also has does a great harm to the system as a whole because it undermines confidence in the system if you if you think the system is is prone to wrongful convictions for some uh, deep-seated reason so by having an independent lab and the chips fall where they fall based on science doesn't d d doesn't that also s strengthen uh, confidence in the system as a whole, I would think. It absolutely does. Yeah, it absolutely does. In fact, uh, you know, one of the one of the things that um, you know we find with the Houston Forensic Science Center is that because they have implemented all of these processes that eliminate bias, and where they can, uh, you know have much more confidence in the accuracy of the work being done, that has redounded to the benefit of prosecutors, right? right who can elicit that information from the analysts um, on direct, uh, or, or when they're trying to respond to defense questions, well, how do you know you're doing good work? They can talk about these processes that have been implemented and, and the independence of the lab um, as evidence that they're doing good work. Um, and, you know, back in the, in the days of the HPD crime lab, on the other hand, um, and we see this around the country periodically, right? When there are wrongful convictions, when there are scandals, what happens is disastrous for the criminal justice system because those sections of the lab have to get shut down. There are audits that are conducted. Um, and in the case and of the case of convictions are, are thrown out too. Right, right, right. The, right. The convictions yeah. are thrown out. Lots of convictions have to be studied. In Boston, there were six in Massachusetts, 60,000 drug cases that had to be reevaluated mm. um, when they discovered that there was, uh, you know, fake testing going on there, dry labbing. Um, and the same thing happened recently in Austin with their um, DNA lab. The result of that is that the cases, you know, with DNA, you're talking about sexual assaults. Those cases in, in Austin basically had to come to a standstill, yeah. right? Because there was no testing being done and whatever tests had been done, they couldn't rely on. And well, and of course, if you, if you wrongfully uh, convict, if you convict the wrong person, that also means that the actual perpetrator is not being convicted and That's is out awesome. there particularly in the types of crimes we're talking about, they're very likely out committing crimes against other, other people. We were able to show that when I wrote my book about the HPD crime lab with regard to George Rodriguez, when he was wrongfully convicted and sentenced to 60 years, the actual culprit we, we showed was out there committing more rapes. Mm. Um, and you know the same thing happened in the Michael Morton case in Texas, um, where the true killer was still out there and he killed another young woman, another young mother, because they convicted the wrong guy. Right, right. Um, so it's absolutely a, a matter of public safety to get this right. Well, and you talked about the, I mean, the undo, when, when something happens, when there's a, a scandal, a wrongful conviction in a community, and then they have to go back and reevaluate all kinds of other cases that may have been brought and convictions accomplished for, for similarly faulty reasons. But also I would think, and I, I, I'm a trial lawyer, so I think a lot about juries and juries after all are made up of citizens who, who come for jury duty and, and are influenced by what they read and what they hear and what's going on in, this, you know, in, in our society and our culture at the time. I would think that although it may be more difficult to, to measure and quantify, 
when ju when juries coming along in future prosecutions after some something or a number of scandals have taken place that has to work its way into the consciousness of jurors and lose confidence in in the credibility and soundness of the prosecution's evidence whereas if if you have the, if a prosecutor has the ability and as again as a trial lawyer i think about this all the time whenever i can strengthen my hand by showing uh the independence of whoever has made a, a, you know an analysis or is offering an opinion i just know that a jury is going to look at that with a great deal more confidence so i, I don't know if there's a way to uh I mean, is there enough experience now? So the, so the Houston uh, Forensic Science Center, and I know, as you mentioned earlier, Nicole, you were the chair of the board of that for a while, and Sandy, you were the vice chair of that for, for some period of time. Is there now a body of experience over the last five, year, five six years to show, I mean, how do we measure the success of, of the work that's being done there? over this five, six year period of time now, I guess is the question. So I have to say that I felt a little thrill when you said that the HFSC is now a model lab because having been involved in this from the beginning, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think that the Houston Forensic Science Center is seen um, among uh, people who know forensics as being uh, probably the best public crime lab in the country, certainly one of the best public crime labs in the country, and maybe even in the world. Um, how the lab can measure its success, I mean, there are a lot of components that go into that, but um, certainly looking at um, backlog reduction, looking at uh, the number of um, cases that the lab uh, can complete um, within the budgetary restraints that it has. Mm -hmm. um, having a, a staff of scientists who are, are, are actively engaged in research and publication, um, uh, certainly accreditation is, is, is one way of, of making sure that a lab is functioning properly. Um, uh, here in Texas, there's also certification for lab analysts. Um, but I, I think this gets us into the topic of our article, really, which is yes. the line testing program, we'll which is another, way to, is another way to, a really important way, I think, to assure that the lab analysts are actually doing their job and doing it appropriately. Well, that's, uh, thank you for can that I, segue. So I didn't get into that. Can yeah. I just add one thing before we go into that? And that yeah. is um, to answer your question also, we would like to know more about forensic labs, uh, but unlike the Houston Forensic Science Center, most of them are extremely not transparent. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like you can't get information. That's, about their yeah. turnaround times, about their backlogs. You're talking about, about labs in other communities? I'm talking about, you know, the FBI crime lab. I'm talking about every forensic lab in the country, yeah. um, except for the Houston Forensic Science Center. And there are a couple in Texas now that are becoming more transparent as well, um, because, again, you know, they, they see what other labs are doing and they start to adopt similar practices and that's a good thing yeah. um, but aside from a couple of labs in Houston and in, in Texas um, you can't get this information uh, and, so and because the Houston Forensic Science Center reports basically to the public right the board is citizens we right. it reports to the public and so one of the board's early on policies was we want as much transparency as possible because we had to rebuild public trust in a lab that was terribly broken. Well, so one of the ways that we could do that was to just put it all out there. Well, I know that's part of the, uh, the way the Houston uh, Forensic Science Center has been set up, that it should be transparent as part mm -hmm. of improving public trust in its work. But 
after all, I would every crime lab in the country from federal on down to state right. is also publicly funded one way. You know, it's just how is it publicly funded? So it's, it's, I think, a big part of the broader problem that we have and that people are starting to talk about now more than ever, more intensely than ever, uh, as, as the Black Lives Matter movement and, and uh, conversation about police reform and accountability uh, are advancing, is a complete lack of transparency. In, at, at all levels of, of police operations. So it's, it's striking to me to hear that here has been this model and it's been working. And I want to get into uh, the article which looks at some of that. Uh, and, we, and, and it just seems like this ought to be part of the shortlist agenda that we all have for how, how police departments ought to be run around the country. Yeah, not totally only are we, not only is the HFSC tra uh, transparent in the sense that, you know, you can go and find what you want, um, but you know, if there's a problem in that lab, it's going to be reported in the media because they're going to put a press release out, and they're going to send notices to the prosecutors about the issue, and they're going to send notices to the defense bar about the issue, and that's the other thing is that this transparency is not only for purposes of the public and the media, but also for researchers who may have an interest and the defense bar uh, for purposes of litigation. So, you know, in most places, um, if a defense attorney wants to see a lab report, they're going to have to file a subpoena um, and get it from the prosecutor. So it's going to go from the lab to the prosecutor and then through uh, to the defense. But this lab works directly with the defense. Um, and in fact, uh, defense lawyers in Houston will frequently call up the analyst in advance of trial um, to have an interview mm -hmm. and find out exactly what tests were run and what did they find. And, and well, when you say it works for the defense, I mean, really, it doesn't work for anybody. It, I mean, in other words, you're right. saying defense has access to has access. the lab, just as the prosecution has, has access. Correct, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And there's a portal where they can go in and they can get their the lab reports for their cases. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, you know, direct from the lab, not going through the courts and through the prosecutor's office. Well, that brings uh, us back to the article because, mm -hmm. because the concept is blind testing. The, 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 your, so to explain what that means and how that works different from how it works, it sounds like almost everywhere else, and, and why that matters in, in the way cases are, are prosecuted or are not prosecuted, I would think. I mean, I would imagine if, if, if evidence is submitted to blind testing and the science says it's not there, you're not going to have a prosecution. So, okay, well, let me explain a little bit about what blind testing is. So, um, laboratories as part of their accreditation requirements are required to uh, have their analysts do what are called proficiency tests. But these are tests where the analyst knows that he or she is being tested. So they have notice, they know, okay, next week I'm going to have to take a proficiency test so they can study. And then of course, when you know you're being tested, right, you perform the very best that you can perform. Um, and those proficiency tests are infrequent. And honestly, and I think the article points this out as well, they're notoriously easy. Tell us the name of the article, just so, just so people have it, please. Sure. Solving Dobert's Dilemma for the Forensic Sciences Through Blind Testing. Um, mm. And it's published by the Houston Law Review. And Dobert is, a, is really the name of a federal case that uh, is used to subject scientific evidence to an analysis by a judge as to whether it should come into evidence, right? That's... Yeah, so this is a, a 1993 United States Supreme Court case. And in and, and the Supreme Court, so this was quite a long time ago, said 
you know, in the past, whenever scientific evidence was introduced in court, uh, the, the judges would let it in as long as other scientists in the field uh, said that it was generally accepted. Uh, and the Supreme Court said, well, you know, that's not really adequate. Uh, under the federal rules of evidence, they really ought to be determined whether it's good science. So they put mm -hmm. the judge to determine as a, as a um, evidentiary matter whether that evidence meets the, um, the scientific method, right? What, whether, whether it was developed through the scientific method. And so this is really a question of foundational validity. It, and in the forensic sciences, the remarkable thing is that we learned in a 2009 study by the National Academy of Sciences that most forensic sciences don't have the underlying statistical research to demonstrate that they are scientifically valid. I mean, this was like mind blowing mm. because things like fingerprints and firearms, these are introduced every day in thousands and thousands of cases in courts across the country. Always, have, you know, the fingerprints have been used for over a hundred years. And we've never had the science to say, yes, in fact, this is good science. This yes. is reliable stuff. And um, part of the reason for that is because uh, lab analysts, when they look at a piece of evidence and analyze a fingerprint, they don't know ground truth. They know what they think. They know that they think this is a match and they've used you know, various criteria to say that it's a match, but we don't really know that person X put that fingerprint on that knife. Mm -hmm. um, and so forensic scientists would say, well, it's impossible to demonstrate. We can't demonstrate because we don't, we, we don't have ground truth. So we can never, we can't ever create that foundational validity that Sandy was talking about. And that's where blind testing yeah. Gap, yeah, because and, you know, it's different, yeah. Uh, what yeah about and, and yet, and yet, like, like historically, you'd have a, a latent print and a analyst on the stand who, you know, it was very common for them to say, I compared these and I determined that that, that there's a match to the exclusion of all others in the world, these come from the same source, um, and and if asked about, you know, how, you know, you're not making a mistake or what's the error rate, it was common to hear them say things like it's a zero error rate. Um, I, I've and, never made a mistake. And yeah. what that means is just, I've never made a mistake that's been caught. That's right, right. right because there's no human endeavor where we don't make mistakes. And actually, like it's really shocking because, again, I deal with a lot of science and medicine in my cases and the idea, but I don't, I don't operate in the criminal world. So, but, but the idea that so many of the foundational uh, bases for a prosecution and a conviction are science, scientific uh, analyses that really aren't themselves subjected to any kind of rigorous scientific support or testing or validating, uh, it's, it's pretty shocking actually. <laughs> It is, it is, but that's exactly what the National Academy of Sciences found, right? So National Academy of Sciences, uh, the, the premier scientific body in the country, you have to be elected by uh, the group. I mean, these are, uh, they count over 500 Nobel Prize winners among them. I mean, they're the best and Congress tasked them with doing a study and that's what they said. They said no forensic method other than nuclear DNA has been rigorously shown to have the capacity consistently and with a high degree of certainty support conclusions about individualization, which is more commonly known as matching mm. of an unknown item to a specific known source. Individualization is what forensic scientists do. That's the heart of it. That's what they're supposed to do is to come into court and provide that pivotal evidence and tell the jury, this is a match, we got the guy. Um, and so 2009 was the date when 
this, you know, revelation, <laughs> um, you know, was published. Uh, and the result has been a, a, a scramble to try to f do that research, right? To, to get that um, support. And so um, forensic scientists and other scientists have been very busy um, trying to figure out how to do this. Because, I mean, keep in mind too, that there are so many kinds of forensic science. Yeah. Um, they, you know, you've got firearms examination, uh, fingerprints, right? Um, they've been doing things like shoe treads and tire treads and paint chips and fiber comparisons and handwriting and other document comparisons, DNA, um, gunshot residue, blood splatter, I mean, on and on, arson. Um, and one thing I think we need to be clear about is that we're not saying that these things are all junk science yeah right we're not there are some things that we have discovered are drug science like bite mark comparisons uh bite mark evidence is highly unreliable um a lot of the traditional uh techniques used by arson investigators have been shown to have no support either um microscopic hair analysis comparative bullet lead there are some some mm -hmm. aspects of that we know are a jug, most of them are not. The problem is we just can't say how good they actually are. Well, and if you can't say how good they are, and it seems like the next step is you can't say that a, a particular analysis using one of these tools can be measured in terms of its reliability as against some standard. You know, there. If if it's just the the analysts say so, well, I think it looks it looks like a match to me. Instead of there being, a, you know, some type of rigorous uh, standard for how you would know whether it was right or wrong. Again, that that is is not blind. That's very biased. Even if some people might be reluctant to actually call it that, but that's that is in fact what it is. So I would say that that's the Dobear dilemma that the article refers to. Mm -hmm. that the Dobear case said, or Daubert, however you prefer it. <laughs> but, I know uh, Texas, they, they yeah. <laughs> you say for a yeah. and not for a deer, so it's uh, okay. Dobear. So the Supreme Court says, you know, that this should be actual science for it to be admissible. Yet scientists say, well, we can't validate this discipline because we never know ground truth. So because we don't know ground truth, we can't show what our error rate actually is. Mm -hmm. So the difference now with a blind testing regimen is that what happens is the laboratory in, in Houston, and it, it's, this wouldn't be possible except the laboratory is a large laboratory and it has a lot of, it has 200 staff member, probably more than that now. Um, but what happens in Houston is that it has, uh, the lab has a quality division, which reports directly to the president CEO. It doesn't, it's not under any of the disciplines so that it's, it has some independence. So the quality division manufactures or obtains um, mock evidence samples. In other words, they're fake, they're, they're fake, they're manufactured. Um, and those mock evidence samples are introduced into the bench analyst workflow. The, the analysts know that there are tests cases going through their workflow, but they don't know which ones they are. Mm -hmm. And so because those evidence samples are manufactured, the quality division knows where the fingerprint came from, which gun fired the bullet they have ground truth and so the the lab at the is sending about five about five percent of the cases done by each section of the lab are blind test samples and so those samples go through and then the lab management the supervisors the ceo the quality division 
can determine whether or not the analyst reached the correct result or not. And that now creates a data set to show, or that would ultimately show when the statistics are robust enough that would show, well, what is the error rate for this discipline, this section, this analyst, this piece of equipment? Mm. Um, so that's the, that not only does that provide a potential error rates, um, it also would notify lab management if forensic fraud was occurring. So if an analyst was dry labbing or you know, adding drugs to samples to create a particular result, because ground truth is known for those 5% of those samples going through the casework, um, ultimately that would be discovered. And I would think that it would serve as a, a discouragement for right. anyone who want to even try it. So, I mean, this to me sounds, so in a way, it, I mean, I know it had to be created in order for it to exist for me to say this, but it seems so obvious to me that, you know, when once you hear about it and learn even just the little bit that we have a chance to learn about it in, in, in our time together, how, how is this, how is this getting out to other communities at this point? It, or well, that's, the, that's why we wrote the article, is yeah. because we want to get the word out that this is happening. But let me just say first that your response about how obvious this is, I mean, that was what I thought as part of the board of directors. I thought, of course, we need to be doing blind testing. This is so elementary. And what I learned was implementing a blind testing program is very, very, very complicated. Mm. But hallelujah, we hired some super smart, dedicated scientists, mm -hmm. and they were determined to find a way to make it work. But really that's what about half of the article is devoted to, just sort of walking through the process, just in three of the lab's divisions. Um, the article would be too long, if we had done that for all the divisions, but, yeah. but from the relatively uncomplicated system in toxicology through the more complicated systems in fingerprints and ballistics, um, be, and I suppose maybe one of the hardest is digital evidence uh, to actually manufacture these blind, blind tests, because even though it sounds easy, it's very, very complicated. But you have to be sure that the analysts do not realize that which items are the blinds. And that, and you have to have cooperation from a lot of other players in order to make the system work. Well, we're going to put a, a link to the article uh, in the description for the episode. If people want to get more background on the Houston Forensic Science Center itself, do, I, I assume they have a website, right? That where they have a fabulous website um, that will will show immediately um, the notion of transparency because okay. you, you can find everything there. And actually, Professor Thompson and I have written some other articles that. Uh, about the lab and the efficiencies uh, and you know, how the lab works to create um, better, more efficient results um, that you, know, you might want to link as well. Yeah, well, when we go offline uh, and uh, before we post this episode, I'll get some of those from you and we'll include those too, because I think there's, there is a lot more to this. I think people ought to learn about, more about this both those in the scientific community and those in the community of people who care about, um, you know, uh, attacking the problem of wrongful convictions, of uh, implicit and, and unconscious bias in all aspects of police and prosecution uh, activities, bringing greater transparency and therefore greater confidence to, to the system we have. Absolutely crucial that we do that. 
And this seems like a really important piece in how to do that. So I, I, I thank both of you very, very much for uh, bringing this to my attention so that we could bring it to the attention of our listeners. Uh, Sandy uh, Garrett Thompson from the University of Houston Law School and uh, Nicole Casares from the University of St. Thomas in Houston. Um, both uh, past uh, chair and vice chair of the Houston Forensic Science Center in Houston. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the work you're doing and thank you so much for sharing it with us today on, on Good Law, Bad Law.